Okay, good evening everyone Welcome to our evening broadcast The Daily Dhamma As promised, today we're going to talk about science Science is the pursuit of knowledge Science involves the idea that there are things that we don't know with the implication that we should know It's a, an aspect of nature, it's a part of nature the state of knowledge Knowledge is a part of the mind's activity There are certain things that we know And there are certain things that we don't know On the other hand, there's a whole lot of things that we think we know That maybe we don't actually know And in fact, if you, if curiously enough, it, it it appears that all of science is merely belief. In the end, when we talk about science, we are really just talking about belief. Now, some belief is resting on what we call evidence, and some belief does not rest on evidence and so certain religions have actually interestingly, strangely from a Buddhist perspective and from a scientific perspective have postulated certain truths without evidence and, and have postulated a, a way of understanding truth without evidence in, the, in other words, belief belief in something without adequate evidence That having admitted that there is insubstantial evidence This isn't a boundary for belief I think Buddhism would um, Would agree with science that this is not a good idea This is not a really honest sort of belief that one should hold And so science sets itself apart from other beliefs in that It sets a standard for what one might call adequate evidence It sets a rather high bar for what one might call adequate evidence uh, Science at, it be at its best is quite rigorous Now in practice, of course, as any scientist As, as many scientists have told me in practice, it's rarely as airtight as one might hope And often monetary concerns and concerns ego gets involved And and this is the first problem that we find with science Even when it is at its most rigorous Is that in the quest for knowledge In our ordinary quest for knowledge, we bring along our our personalities, right? We bring bring along culture, borrowing from what we talked about yesterday. Most scientists bring along culture, unknowingly, um, or knowingly, and so as science at its worst. Involves corrupt scientists, um, bias, uh, exhibiting bias because of where the money's coming from, or 
in order to get funding or in order to for uh, for prestige and and so on but science at its best most science at its best is still coupled with the baggage of culture and this is generally the culture of what we call physicalism so we're born into this world not with a blank slate and nor are we given the opportunity to examine the world objectively we're immediately thrust into a paradigm of people, places, and things, concepts. Our parents don't set out to teach us the Abhidhamma when we're first born. No, they teach us, they teach us this is apple, this is birdie, this is mama, this is dada. Right? They teach us a, sort of a relational uh, paradigm. Where things are spatially and in in terms of their importance and their quality of good and bad, yummy, uh, yummy food, good girl, good boy, bad girl, bad boy. We're taught. We're taught reality. Uh, most especially, well, we're taught many unfortunate things as we grow up, but most unfortunate is our reliance. You know, the, the human being relies very much on temporal spatial reality. It means time and space. We rely on the past and the future just to get by. You know? How many of us could live our lives without relying on plans for the future or lessons learned in the in the past even our social relationships would fall apart we'd have to shave our he our heads put on rags and go and live in the forest or something we wouldn't be able to survive and space we have to think in terms of things have to think in terms of uh, the physical world, possessions, belongings, relationships with other people. <coughs> We're thrust into a a impersonal reality, uh, which is actually somewhat surprisingly counterintuitive though most people would say it is completely intuitive it in fact is from the point of view of the baby who comes out of the womb and sees stuff lights shapes movements right and hears sounds what does the baby make of all these things well they carry over from their past lives and potentially beliefs but to some extent, they they do have this. There is somewhat of a clean slate, you might argue. They're seeing light, mama. <laughs> uh, the mother will coo at the baby, and so on. And they feel sensations, the harsh, the harsh cloth that is so different from the womb that they the warmth of the mother's womb. The pain for the baby at childbirth. I don't know if children experience pain coming out of the the, the vaginal cavity, but or whatever you call it. But uh, must be quite shocking. The bright lights and the sounds, and then they have to make sense. What does this all mean? And what they're taught what is impressed upon them and must be helped along by having lived this life, this sort of life again and again. It's, it's not simply seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, feeling, thinking. We're given this artificial paradigm of space and time. 
when the very basis is just seeing, hearing, smelling, it's just experience. And so the first problem with science is that it tends to be very, very, very much enmeshed in this, this paradigm of external reality. Instead of focusing on personal experience, personal experience is seen as unreliable, prone to subjectivity, right? partiality or, or bias or errors in judgment. And the second problem with science, this is the first, play, first way that it differs from Buddhism. Buddhism, and we'll talk about Buddhist science, Buddhism claims some, to some extent a sort of a science, but the other problem is that Buddhism isn't actually about knowledge. Wisdom isn't the goal. I often talk about and say that wisdom is the goal, but it's just shorthand for, for describing what the real goal is, and the real goal is happiness, peace, freedom from suffering. And that's an important difference, because science science is, is getting obsessed with the knowledge, irrespective of whether it actually makes you happy or, or, or brings peace, Right? If there's a discovery to be had, there's a scientist who will, there's, all scientists will jump at the opportunity to, to be the one to discover, right? And so to some extent, there's a sense that it makes you happy to be the one who discovers something. But that's not what Buddhism is about. Buddhism isn't about this obsession with knowledge. And so we talk about the Four Noble Truths, and the important word here that we often gloss over is noble. Arya. That's what makes them special. Not that they're the truth. We're not so concerned about the truth, honestly. We're concerned about becoming free from suffering. Because you can't really ever know the truth. We say the truth is that everything, nothing is worth clinging to. Well, you can't know that. Right? There could be something around the next corner. If you just meditated a little bit longer, maybe you'd find something that was worth clinging to. Meditation even relies, what we talk about, the Four Noble Truths, even they rely on belief. It's called anumana. Anumana means uh, an inference. You have to infer. So it's described thus that when a person realizes the Four Noble Truths, it's, it's an epiphany. Um, it's it's not a realization of actual knowledge because you can't actually know. But you get to the point where you have sufficient evidence, and this is very much like science, but it's sufficient for the mind, where the mind finally says, I get it, it's true, nothing is worth clinging to. Now, it, it doesn't yet know that because it hasn't seen... Uh, all phenomena. It has only experienced one phenomenon. <laughs> yeah, maybe you could argue. Maybe you could argue that you're seeing that one phenomenon so clearly that you understand the nature of phenomena. Because all phenomena are the same, all phenomena are the same, but it's still got to be an inference of sorts. Because theoretically, there could be something, and this is why scientists, you know, intellectually, they say, you can never prove a theory, you can only disprove it. And you're always just waiting for the disproof. And if there's never a disproof, well, then you accept it for uh, provisionally. Meditation isn't like that. There is a, a clarity, a perfect clarity that comes, but it's only in relation to one thing. 
But there's something quite special about this, you see. I mean, it's a very different state than intellectually saying, oh yes, the speed of light is uh, whatever, E equals mc squared, matter and you know, this, this kind of intellectual reasoning. It doesn't have any profound impact on your state of mind, though it may change the way you look and the way you think about reality. It doesn't actually change your outlook, your your the nature of your mind. The Four Noble Truths are quite special in that they do change. That that seeing certain things, certain realities, have a fundamental impact on the nature of the mind. So in Buddhism we talk about the power of knowledge. The power of, of uh, insight or wisdom But really we're talking about knowledge, jnana There are certain knowledges that, that Well, there's a certain type of knowledge That doesn't have this impact So we call them sutta maya panya This is knowledge that you've heard about And jinta maya panya Is knowledge that you've thought up on your own these ones don't have a profound impact on your life Even knowledge of Buddhism There are Buddhists who know very, very much about People who have read the whole of the Buddhist teaching Once, twice over But that doesn't have a profound impact on your mind It, it may seem like it does You may feel, wow Reading all this Buddhist teachings It's really changed my outlook on reality And okay, so to some extent it might But that's not the effect of insight meditation practice It's not the same thing It's not the same as Observing reality moment by moment Watching experiences arise and cease And really viscerally feeling the The change come about in the way you look at reality Seeing your ego, seeing your attachment, seeing your Your dissatisfaction and your, your your irritability and inability to bear with reality And overcoming it Changing, watching your mind change as you see your, your flaws, as you see your mistakes So I said uh, last night, I think I said that We're at once the, well, we're at once the scientist and the lab rat that's a crucial distinction is We're experimenting on ourselves Or not experimenting, but we're studying ourselves And so this is the ar arguably something that Buddhism has over science That science doesn't actually address one's culture Doesn't actually address the paradigm The way one looks at reality In general, I mean It, it generally doesn't it makes certain assumptions It looks at reality in a certain way Buddhism is simply the science of, uh, of the individual Knowledge about the individual, about one's own mind Science of experience, maybe And so what we're concerned with it's merely an understanding of our own habits, our own behaviors The nature of our own minds How we like and dislike certain things How we build up habits based on likes and dislikes How we cultivate ego and identification All of this is the object of insight meditation And so this is important as meditators that we don't get obsessed with knowledge Even with insight knowledge It's not about those aha moments where you get it Where you realize, oh, I get, I understand, I see impermanence, I see suffering, I see non-self Meditators will often describe these experiences kind of excited and happy 
but it's not that experience that we're it's it's not the knowledge that's important it's the state of one's mind so even insight knowledge is not something you should cling to or or see as the goal it's encouraging of course to see these things but even when we see even when we see reality even that can become an object of clinging if we like or if we're excited about it and we have to remind ourselves that it's about us it's not about that knowledge it's about how we react to it how we react to reality how we interact with our experience Don't get caught up in, in intellectualizing or, or thinking about meditation practice. Even when you experience knowledge, the Buddha said it's like a raft. A raft has a purpose, and once its purpose is over, you don't pick the raft up and walk away with it. You throw it away. When you use a raft to cross a river, well, good for you, good for the raft. It was a good raft. A good raft doesn't mean you pick it up and carry it with you. Knowledge is the same. Throw it away. Once you've crossed the river, keep going. So there you go. Some brief thoughts about science. How Buddhism could in some ways be considered a science. In other ways, it's not at all about the science. It's all about the results. So we only worry about a certain type of science, which of course is the tool. You know, without that science, without that knowledge, without the realizations, you could never become enlightened. I mean, that's the other side of this coin, is that anyone who thinks they're just going to sit and through calming the mind somehow become enlightened has a, is in for a rude awakening. Well, no, is in for years and years of pointless exercise where they just sit and are calm and peaceful and become attached and even egotistical about their peace. Meditation, meditation of that sort can't free you from suffering. That without science, without knowledge, without realizing the truth, impermanent suffering, non-self, that all, no, no thing is worth clinging to, even calm and peace and tranquility. Without realizing that, you can't become enlightened. So there you go. There's our bit of Dhamma for tonight. Are you, uh, are you leaving tomorrow? Or soon? Yeah. Okay. You want to say hello to everyone? Hello, everyone. Tell us about what happened. Tell us about a little bit about just the, what happened. Why, why am I having you say hello? Well, I'm I'm finishing. Uh, come close. Come this side. <laughs> I'm uh, finishing uh, my uh, my stay here, and uh, introduce yourself. Uh, my name is Will Will Stevenson. I'm from from New York, and uh, I just uh, completed my program. How was it? Uh, very revealing for me um you know uh, now when i hear the talks they they mean different things to me um because i've directly experienced some things i had only an intellectual appreciation for before and uh you know i'm probably i've learned about myself that i am one of the types of people that uh clinged some to the intellectual appreciation you know, I thought through knowledge that um, uh, a greater appreciation for peace would come. But um, <laughs> that is certainly not the case, you know, and really only through direct observation of the simple things of life in a very kind of, uh, I guess, myopic, controlled situation as it you know, it, it, again, it's not like you had said it tonight. It's not like uh, I had aha moments. It's mm -hmm. really just exposed to me that uh, it's the tip of the iceberg. Mm. You know, 
So now I'm <laughs> we've moon moved from the unknown unknowns into the known unknowns. <laughs> uh -huh. Yeah. Nice. So tip of the iceberg. Well, that's it. That is really what the foundation course it should show you the iceberg and say <laughs> this is what you've got to work on. Yeah. It's a little oh, but <laughs> <laughs> a little scary. But yeah, yeah. But well, the first step. But in a good way, you know. Uh, well, thank so you, Will. Thank you so much. There you go. You still alive? Yes. <laughs> it's not uh it's not uh not such a scary thing to do the course. People do survive it. I've n I've never had to bury anyone. So my teacher said he'd always say, "If you die, I'll I'll do your funeral for free." I mean, the joke is that monks go to funerals. They they do ceremonies for for when people die. So, and it costs a lot of money. You don't you pay the monk. You, know, you give monks usually donations a little bit, but it's not just that. There's, of course, lots of costs that go in. And um, but anyway. He says, I'll, I'll do do the chanting free. <laughs> or, I think it's more than that, he would probably arrange the funeral. We'd arrange a funeral. If anyone died meditating, we'd for sure <laughs> arrange the funeral. Right, right, Robin? It's the least we could do. <laughs> it's on our waiver. Our waiver says it, you can. It, you have to be aware that meditation can lead to death, among other things. We just we were we were discussing this. The question of how do we, how do we work on you know how do we make sure to to not you know get into legal battles and so on. You know how do we how do we avoid having problems with meditation? Say, well, let's let's just put a waiver and say you know this could lead to death and dismemberment and so on and, and you're aware and you're not going to hold us responsible even if it kills you <laughs> so far no one's died did I see a question there? A big one. Can we take scientific knowledge as wisdom? Isn't wisdom all about good judgment and knowing what is beneficial? I mean, this is semantics. It depends what you mean by wisdom. I think the Buddha would... Let me see. No, I think in Orthodox Buddhism, yes, it would have to be something to do with Buddhism, actually. It would have to be in line with the Buddha's teaching. So knowledge of, knowledge of the atom bomb isn't actually wisdom. And so that's really, I mean, I, I kind of mentioned that. I said it's, you know, we're not obsessed with knowledge. We're obsessed with what is beneficial. We're focused on on the, the results of of good knowledge. Jnana, Panya, and Vija refer to wisdom. Jnana, Ngudapadi, Chakku, Ngudapadi, Jnana, Ngudapadi. Yeah, so they're all, I mean, they're all synonymous. They're just, um, they're, they're, I mean, they're used synonymously. They're not actually synonymous. I mean, knowledge, jnana means knowledge. It's very clear. Banya, interestingly enough, is just nya with a pa on the front. So pa, banya, jnana, the difference is the pa. Because the root is nya. Jnana is uh, turning the root to know into knowledge. And banya is adding, adding an a on the end, discerning nya into nya. And then pa becomes so pa is separate. Panya is actually, if in the dictionary it would be different. Jnana will just be any type of knowledge, but panya is like wisdom, true knowledge, that kind of thing. Vidya, vidya is a little bit different flavor. So vidya comes from vid, which is where you get the word vedana. Uh, so. Uh, vedana means something that you experience. So vidya is like experience. It's used. It's translated often as knowledge, and it's used as knowledge. But uh, it's it's a knowledge that you get from experience. So it's a different, a whole different root. Uh, but 
but you know it, culturally even in the Buddhist time it had come out to mean the same thing or be used in the same way although there was something Widja is a little bit more you know, experiential I guess but but special in a way or is it wait just a second Widja Widja Vinya yeah yeah Widja Okay, we had a few more questions here on the website. Let's uh, go through them quickly. How important is chanting to the meditation practice? Are there any signs when one reaches a state of true awareness? Those are two different questions. Chanting is not really important, except the mantra that we use is kind of important. So me meditation is kind of a chant. So you'd say pain, pain when you feel pain, but it's a different kind of chant because the object is what you're experiencing, so it keeps you focused on what you're experiencing. Any other kind of chanting is just going to be a type of meditation, sort of, that, that is conceptual. Like Iti Piso Bhagavā's Mindfulness of the Buddha, that's good, it's useful, but it's only conventionally useful. Are there any signs when one reaches a state of true awareness? Yes, when one reaches a state of true awareness, having realized Nibbāna, one will have a sense that something has changed. One will have a sense that things are not as they were before. One will have a clear understanding that something is missing, something has gone, something has changed, and also have a clear sense of what is left to do. So one will have uh, generally a good moral ethic and uh, we'll be able to differentiate between what is the path and what is not the path and one will have perfect confidence in the right path in, in Buddhist meditation because one will come to see that it actually does lead to the, the goal is there a proper way to use or incorporate par prayer beads in our meditation practice I'm unsure of the purpose of the beads Thank you in advance. Well, they don't really have a purpose in our meditation. They they were used sort of for counting, right? So, certain meditations involve counting, like you're chanting the Buddha's name 108 times. So you you do that one bead for every time. There's different conventional ways they can be used. It's just in our tradition we don't use them. Are there other means, f aside from walking meditation, to cultivate effort with a hand motion? Didn't we talk about this? Didn't I answer this question? So there'd be some effort that you'd get from that, but it's not the same as walking. What are your thoughts on the formless jhanas? I don't really think about them too much. Do you see any value in practicing these kinds of meditations? You seem to see trying this kind of a long way around, achieving the more important goal of insight. Yes, that's still my perspective. Inquire about the stillness, silence of the mind and body while sitting. Answer your question. Okay. Well, sitting there is space of observation. At times, those magical experiences occur after prolonged periods. Periods, I see them arise and fall. Yeah. Well, I mean, I've talked about it in the imperfections of insight, stillness, quiet is is. Silent stillness is a is called pasati. It's still a fairly low level of insight. So if you feel calm or, or you know if you feel quiet or still, you should say quiet, quiet or still, still. Just stay noting it. And note anything else that comes. So if you see something, seeing, seeing. If you hear, if you feel bliss or rapture, you'd say feeling, feeling. Like everything else, it's impermanent suffering and non-self. It's not going to satisfy you. It's not something you can cling to or or something you should identify with as this is me, this I am. You should see it as impermanent, unsatisfying and uncontrollable. 
and let it go. Okay, so there's our questions. Thank you everyone for coming. Wish you all a good night.